I'm Terry Graydon. Welcome to this special podcast from the People's Pharmacy. We're delighted to bring you an interview with Dr. Marvin Singh, an integrative gastroenterologist who's also board certified in internal medicine. Dr. Singh brings a unique perspective to the practice of precision medicine. During this podcast, we'll provide insights into improving intestinal health. You'll learn more about the microbiome and how to reestablish a healthy gut balance. Dr. Singh will provide insights into why it's so important to keep our digestive tracts healthy during the pandemic and beyond. This special podcast is available only to podcast subscribers. It's brought to you by the Verizona Health Club. This comprehensive home testing service enables you to track crucial health markers of gut health, inflammation, metabolism, hormones, thyroid function, and many other organ systems. Regular testing can help detect health imbalances before they lead to sickness. Find it online at V-E-R-I-S-A-N-A dot com slash health dash club. Today on the People's Pharmacy Podcast, we're talking with Dr. Marvin Singh. He's founder and CEO of Precision Clinic and director of integrative gastroenterology at the University of California, Irvine. Dr. Singh is a board member of the American Board of Integrative Medicine. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy Podcast, Dr. Marvin Singh. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Dr. Singh, you are an integrative gastroenterologist. You you bring to our conversation a unique perspective, but I know our listeners are going to want to know, what is an integrative gastroenterologist and what is precision medicine? Well, that's a great question. Uh, integrative medicine and integrative gastroenterology is basically practicing good medicine or good gastroenterology with more tools in your toolbox. So we do the proper workup. We can do the proper endoscopies or scans or anything else you need, but we are able to really pay more attention to the whole person, the whole body, and look at other elements of health and your environment that could really be impacting how you feel. And then using different modalities to kind of help people's symptoms from a more comprehensive overarching way. Uh, Meaning we focus on mind gut connection, we may use natural therapies or herbs and supplements instead of prescription medications or pharmaceuticals. And, um, uh, you know, some of these things are just as good or even better than uh, the pharmaceutical medications themselves. And so that's what integrative medicine is. It's it's really just having more tools in your toolbox and practicing good medicine. That's what Andy Weil taught us on the first day of our integrative medicine fellowship training. So that's what I tell everybody when they ask me that question. And uh, precision medicine is really looking at your health from a very precise, highly individualized manner. I coined the term precisionomics, and precisionomics is is a term that I made up that really describes what the next generation of healthcare really is. It's a brand new way of looking at your health using cutting-edge science and technology to help really uncover the secrets to your personal wellness, your personal wellness, not the general population's personal wellness, but what matters really to you because it's really focusing on the individual rather than the population um, that really matters because it's it's you that wants to get well at the end of the day. Well, how would you find out exactly what factors are affecting an individual patient's health? That's a great question. I mean, usually I start off my visits, my conversations with a, a new patient. Uh, it's about 90 minutes. So we spend a lot of time uh, talking to people about who they are, where you know where they came from, what their background is, because that's important to know. When you're in a standard doctor office, can you imagine the last time you actually spent fi- uh, more than 15 minutes talking to the doctor? I mean, that, that really doesn't happen. Um, and spending 90 minutes with a doctor is almost unheard of. But I do it on purpose because I want to make sure that I get all the information that I need. The conversation that you have the first time you meet somebody is actually one of the most important tasks that you can do. And then we do different things. We can look at your genes. We can look at your gut, your microbiome. We can look at 
food sensitivities, environmental exposures, inflammatory markers, check for leaky gut. There's a whole host of things uh, that we can do to kind of really give a viewpoint of what's actually going on. Some people will, you know, just uh, run a blood panel and, um, you know, check a couple of labs in your thyroid or something and say that this is what your health looks like. Everything looks good. I don't know how many times I've seen people go to the doctor and get a physical exam and and, uh, their annual physical and get a clean bill of health. And then the next year they're, uh, you know, had a major heart attack or something like that, or a new diagnosis of cancer. I mean, this is not really precision medicine the way that uh, medicine is practiced now. Precision medicine is really looking more deeply into your health so that we can actually understand what's actually happening with the major players inside your body. Now, you bring a broad perspective to the table because your expertise is gastroenterology as well as internal medicine. And on top of that, you have the integrative medicine perspective. But I'd like to focus for a moment on gut health and how gut health can influence other aspects of our health. I think, you know, for decades, your colleagues just sort of took gut health for granted. Now, microbiome is a part of the lexicon. Everybody talks about it, but not too many people understand it. So help us better appreciate why gut health is so important to our overall health. Sure. The microbiome, first, I guess we should make some common definitions. So when we say microbiome, we're really referring to a major ecosystem uh, inside of your digestive tract. And the digestive tract starts in the mouth and goes all the way to the end where you have your bowel movement. And uh, there are trillions of microbes, which we mean viruses, bacteria, fungi, predominantly bacteria, but we should also point out that there are other types of microbes that live there as well. There are trillions of these microbes that live in your digestive tract. Normally, they're supposed to be there. We collectively refer to these things as the microbiome or the gut microbiome. There are actually multiple microbiomes throughout your entire body. There's a skin microbiome. There's an oral microbiome. We know there's a gut microbiome there. If you read the literature, there are microbiomes in different places too that we're discovering in in smaller populations, not as much as what you would find in the gut, but there's a like a lung microbiome. There's an eye microbiome. So these are really just uh, collections of bacteria or microorganisms that live in various parts of your body. And most likely they all communicate with each other to get various jobs and functions done. Our gut microbiome is really a major player in our health because it controls the majority of our immune system. It's the seat of our immune system. 70 to 80% of our immune system lies in the gut. And the, the gut can produce neurotransmitters and hormones and uh, help with digestion and motility and control inflammation. So you can imagine that it's a very important force. It's not just, you know, uh, an organ system that digests the food that you eat. It does do that, but it's not that simple. It, it does a lot more than uh, you can actually imagine. Well, it does make sense that there would be a link between the digestive system and the immune system, because after all, the gut is one of the main ways that stuff like pathogens could get into the body. So you want to have the immune system at the ready to kick them out if they show up, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that starts right from the beginning from, you know, that's why the the uh, stomach has an acidic environment. It's to, to help fight off the bad guys. And there are some microbes in the stomach. There's some stum- uh, some microbes in the small bowel and majority of them live in the colon and all of these guys uh, work together. We're This is still very early science. We don't know 100% what uh, every function is uh, of every microbe uh, in the microbiome, but we're learning little by little what some certain patterns and things are um, between certain uh, microorganisms and, and how they affect your, your microbiome. Dr. Singh, with the caveat that we can't address, obviously, with any precision, an individual's specific situation, are Mm -hmm. there 
overall recommendations of things we should all be doing to improve our intestinal health? Certainly. That's a great point uh, because a lot of times um, we want to know uh, what's a, a blanket diet, what are some of the things that everybody can do to make a perfect microbiome. And the answer is not so simple a lot of the time because if each of us are only, you know, a 10 to 20% similar, it's in, almost impossible to make a generic recommendation to make a perfect microbiome for everybody on the planet. But there are some basic concepts that do apply to all human beings. And I've actually written about this. Uh, I wrote the lifestyle chapter in the a textbook of integrative gastroenterology, where I combed through all the literature and found some really fascinating studies uh, in each of these categories. So some of them include very simple things like sleep. If you sleep the proper amount, uh, your microbiome will be happy. We know that alterations in circadian rhythms, alterations in your sleep cycles can actually cause imbalances in your microbiome that are similar to the imbalances that you might find in somebody with inflammation or obesity. So that's, it's very, very fascinating. Um, uh, other things we can do are exercise, movement. You know, the doctor always says, oh, well, you should eat healthy and, and exercise and it's good for your heart. But how is it good for your heart? What is happening? What, what are some of the things that are happening inside your body that make it good for your heart? One of the things that is happening is that the microbiome is becoming more diverse and resilient because studies show that the microbiome responds to exercise and movement as well. So by exercising, people that exercise have a more diverse microbiome. And with diversity comes strength and resiliency, and that's what we want. Stress reduction is also a major thing. We often take it for granted, but stress can really do a number on the microbiome. And uh, if we reduce stress, we can also create uh, more diversity in the microbiome and a healthier environment. Here's an example. Stress is, is such a fascinating topic when it comes to the microbiome. Um, there, there's some literature that would suggest that when you're under stress, you release chemicals and hormones that re relate to stress that are, um, you know, that are released in the, in the gut. And these chemicals uh, can be what we call quorum sensing. So it brings all, a lot of microbes to the table. Um, you know, when you call a quorum to a meeting, it's basically the same concept. And what happens is that some of the guys that are good guys that are really just minding their business, not doing anything bad, they now have the opportunity to turn into bad guys just because they're there and that's what's happening. So basically how we describe it medically is that a non-pathogenic organism could potentially become pathogenic in the setting of stress. Well, we so, all know that when we're under stress, uh, sometimes our digestive tracts react in a very yeah. negative way, and we have to make a couple of trips to the bathroom. That, that's especially true when people have to give a talk in front of a large group of people. All of a sudden, they say, "Oh, just wait a second! I, I, I got to make a <laughs> I got to make a pit stop." So right. it, it seems like our digestive tracts react very quickly to stress. Yeah, they do, and I mean that's your alteration in your motility you know, uh, as well, that happens when there's a lot of stress. So these are some of the basic things that we can do um, to to really cultivate a healthy microbiome. Diet goes without saying, um, obviously, but I usually talk about some of these other things before diet because we often only talk about diet and emphasize diet. And I want to remind everybody that these are also very important topics. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a bit about diet because we are in the age I'm afraid, of the coronavirus. And what that yeah. means is an awful lot of people are home, they're working from home, or they're just staying home. Mm -hmm. And that means snacking. And that means mm -hmm. junk food. And that means comfort food, because a lot of people are just feeling under stress. And so when we're snacking on junk food throughout the day, that can affect the microbiome. Sure. So could sitting around in front of the computer all day. And in combination, it's a double whammy. <laughs> so I think, you know, a lot of this is perhaps a little bit of some self-discipline. Um, you know, I think, it, you know, a lot of people uh, gone through this uh, process, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. But uh, as things are passing, it's been about six months now. 
uh, I think uh, a lot of people are kind of realizing how it's impacted them and trying to kind of get back on the wagon and uh, and not fall off um, again. And that's important to remember uh, and do. Um, snacking throughout the day, you know, uh, if it's healthy snacks, it's one thing. If it's if it's uh, an unhealthy snack, that's another thing. But uh, in general, you know, we want to try to watch how many calories you're taking in in a day. Because if you're sitting around and then eating snacks all day, then all you're doing is uh, is creating more calories rather than burning them off. And so you're, you're losing twice. You're losing because you're taking in something and then you're losing again because you're not burning it off. Now, Dr. Singh, how would we know if our microbiome is in balance or if it's out of balance? Are there markers? Sure. Um, there are things you can do to um, check your microbiome and see what the status of things are. One of the one, one of the, I guess, poor man's way of checking without doing any test is really looking and paying attention to your bowel patterns. You know, if you have a nice, healthy, um, soft, easily passable bowel movement uh, on a regular basis, then that may be an indication that things are on track. And if you feel good afterwards, that's also another indication that things are on track. But, you know, not to be gross, but uh, if... Uh, if it splashes on the way down, we, we always say that that's, uh, that's really an indicator that, you know, something's missing from the diet because uh, that means that you didn't get enough fiber in the diet and that you need to drink more water, eat more healthy, you know, perhaps look at uh, the other factors, uh, stress, how much you're sleeping and things like that. Because if you're more constipated or have harder stool, then that could be an indication that something is uh, amiss. Uh, also the same with the opposite. If you have more looser stools, we want to look at that as well. So we want to try to find that happy medium, that balance. Dr. Singh, I think if we asked your colleagues 20 years ago, well, what do you know about the microbiome? <laughs> Most healthcare professionals would sort of look at you with, with a blank stare. Now, I think everybody has heard of the microbiome, but your internist colleagues would say, you know, we don't know what to do about that. There's, you know, we, we have tests to check on heart function. I mean, we, we, can, we can do a blood panel. We can look at your LDL. We can look at your HDL. We can look at your triglycerides. We can, we can analyze for lots of different things in your bloodstream to mm -hmm. determine, you know, heart health. We, we can check your kidney function. We, we've got all these tests, mm -hmm. but, but we don't have any tests for the microbiome. One of our sponsors is Verizona, and they support our public radio show and our newsletter. They also support the podcast, and they actually have a test for the microbiome. Can you tell us a little bit about actually testing to see what's going on and what the balance is? Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, what's actually special about Verisana is that they don't just have a microbiome test. They have actually a health plan. And this is really an amazing opportunity for people really to practice what I preach uh, in, in a very simple, easy manner. This is really precisionomics to the general population. This is exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, what I mean by their health plan is that they, it's uh, on a monthly basis, you'll get a, a different kind of test kit that comes to your house that uh, will test uh, a particular parameter of your health on a regular basis so that you can stay on top of your health all throughout the year, not just like, oh, I'm going to go to the doctor and I'm going to do, you know, my blood panel and I'll see him again next year. And you're not checking anything in between because we know that our health fluctuates and changes as we go along. And so does the gut. So one of the things that is part of this health plan is uh, gut testing as well. So, you know, and it goes through a variety of cycles and they'll check it a couple of times uh, during the year so that we can see how it is when you begin and then we can see how it is midway through and so that you have the opportunity really to make um, changes to your regimen, your diet, your lifestyle once you see something is amiss and then see what happened when you made those changes. So this is really, this health plan is really a wonderful way of being able to find out what your risk factors are before they arise, 
test a variety of uh, parameters, really focusing on early detection. And uh, it's a very nicely curated menu of tests where you really don't have to worry about it. You know, one of the things that I always tell people is, you know, how many times have you gone to the doctor and they say, okay, well, Bob, we should check your cholesterol, we should check your vitamin D, we should check your CBC, your metabolic panel, here's the lab slip, go to the lab, I'll take a look at it. And you say in your head, okay, okay, I'll, I'll do that tomorrow because I'm really busy right now. I barely just made it to this doctor appointment. And then tomorrow comes and you're like, well, I'll do it next week and then next week and then next week. And then really you realize six months later that uh, you never did it. And and I know that this must be the case because this has happened to me and I'm a doctor and I talk about this stuff before. So years ago, this 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 used to happen to me all the time. And I would realize that six months have passed and I never really got my cholesterol or my vitamin D checked. And then, then you're kind of embarrassed. It's like, oh, am I going to do the test now? Because the guy's going to be like, what are you t- doing this for now? I did you, I ordered this six months ago and you didn't even do it um, at the time. So then you may even just become non-compliant and not even do it at all. Um, and then follow up next year and makes up some excuse as to why it didn't happen uh, or another. And what happened really in that whole time is you didn't get anything tested. You didn't get anything checked. You lost the opportunity to really understand what your risks are. And really, that's the importance of precision genomics and precision medicine is really understanding your risks before they become problems. And so here, you're going to get something in the mail every month. All you have to do is just receive it, do it and mail it back. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to get anybody to draw your blood. It's nothing special. You do it and you send it out. And uh, it's really a wonderful way of staying on top of your health. And the gut testing that they do also, you know, screens for a variety of organisms um, uh, to your original question. Um, and we do they do this a couple of times during the year. And you get an idea of how balanced or imbalanced the gut may be so that you can decide what particular uh, issues you may have, do you have uh, a yeast overgrowth? Um, do you have a dysbiosis or an imbalance in the in the microbes that are present there? Um, do you have H. pylori or Helicobacter pylori? Do you have any markers of inflammation? So, really, um, uh, that's that's what the health plan is all about. Well, the convenience of that sounds like it could be really important at a time when we're trying to minimize our sorties out of the house and uh, certainly don't want to make unnecessary trips into doctor's clinics and such. Obviously, if we're having a medical emergency, that requires a trip. Mm-hmm. Um and we but should I say wanted... this this is not a replacement for for a physician. That's I mean exactly... everybody should know that this is one way that you can really take control of your health without needing somebody to kind of babysit you along the way. And if you find that something is abnormal, then you go and talk to your doctor and say, "Hey, I did this blood test and my LDL is 200. I, I think we should probably look at this, you know." Well, and, that uh, is exactly what I that is exactly what I wanted to ask because you get the result, then what do you do about it? Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that you may need some guidance as to how to address an abnormal finding. Yep. It's very possible that you might. And that's the good thing because, you know, if you didn't do the test, you would never know that you needed that guidance. And these are the circumstances by which you develop a problem when it just happens cumulatively over time, over time, you know. So this is really one way to kind of t- uh, take ownership of over your health and well, and you know really that, that's harsh. so that's so important, Doctor Singh, because I think the old way of thinking about your health was you know maybe once a year you'd go to see the doctor and, and you get a checkup, mm-hmm. and you know that might end up being once every two years or once every three years. And mm-hmm. some people only went to the health care provider if something was wrong. You know, mm-hmm. if all of a sudden they had this really bad headache and it wouldn't go away, mm-hmm. or if they developed some other symptom and it was just interfering with the quality of their life. And I think what you have been advocating is the idea of taking ownership of your health right, and being much more proactive Hopefully, with a healthcare provider who is interested in working with you, so that it's a shared decision making process. And so, the concept of home health testing 
is still relatively new. Mm-hmm. I mean, people are, are you know, they, they know that if they go to the doctor's office, they'll get this recommendation to go to the lab. It may even be in the doctor's office or a laboratory clinic someplace. And then, like you say, they might do it or they might not do it, depending on how busy they are. But the idea of a test actually coming to your home on a somewhat regular basis that allows you to assess a whole bunch of functions, Mm -hmm. not the least of which is, for example, thyroid. You know, there are a lot of underdiagnosed hypothyroid patients in this country just because they don't know what to look for and maybe their doctor never considered it. Can you tell us a little bit about ownership of your health and in particular with regard to the thyroid and the gut? Because I think a lot of people don't even contemplate that there could be a relationship between those two things. Yeah, exactly. And part of this health plan it actually is monitoring your thyroid. So um, uh, you are able to do that um, uh, through the year uh, a few times as well, just to make sure that your levels remain stable and accurate. To your question about the microbiome, the, the microbiome plays a large role in a lot of different things. And it also plays a role in um, uh, production of vitamins as it does with production of hormones. And so Obviously, we have a thyroid gland, uh, where is really kind of the the main frame of uh, thyroid hormone uh, production and metabolism. But the microbiome also plays a role in your levels of these hormones as well. And so that's why I always say that it is important to look at all of these elements. You can't just check your thyroid and say, well, your TSH is normal. So therefore, your gut must be okay because the gut makes the thyroid hormone. That is the wrong way of looking at things. You got to look at everything together. You can't just look at somebody's genes and say, oh, all your genes are good, so you must be good. You're going to live a long life. That's not the way to look at it either. You got to look at all of these things together, all of them. You have to look at the hormones. You have to look at your vitamin levels. You have to look at your cholesterol panel. You have to look at the microbiome. You have to look at your hormones. You have to look at the inflammatory markers. You have to look at all of these things in order to really understand what's going on. I, you know, I, I tell people an example of what your health is like inside your body is imagine a snow globe. You know, when you when you have the snow globe sitting on your desk, it's doing nothing. That's what it, that's what you know when you're looking at somebody, a human human body. You know, that's what it may appear to. But when you want to really, when you when you ask the human body, the human person, what are your symptoms? What's going on? Then you shake that snow globe, and you see all those little snowflakes flying around inside. And the answer to the questions that you're seeking are in those snowflakes, not in one snowflake, not in two snowflakes, but in all of those snowflakes, because that's the design of the body. That's why the microbiome is able to communicate with your genes and your genes with your microbiome and and uh, your hormones are related and your vitamin production can come from the microbiome, uh, you know, and so the body has many different functions, but they all all of these differentiated elements of your body work together in harmony. It's like a, it's like a perfect uh, orchestra when, uh, when, when you look at it. So, you know, the conductor can make beautiful music when he can get all the snowflakes or all the uh, musical instruments to play together nicely. And that's what we want. That's what we want when we're doing things like this Verisana Health Plan, when we're looking at precision medicine, or precision nomics. This is what precision nomics is at its best. It's looking at all the elements of your health and then figuring out how to correct the parts that are abnormal and then monitoring them continuously and looking at different parts of your body, not just one part. Dr. Singh, one of the contexts in which a lot of patients think of their microbiome and would like to know what to do about it is Mm -hmm. when they have to take antibiotics for an infection. Mm -hmm. Antibiotics in general are notorious for disrupting the gut flora, the the inhabitants (laughs) of our digestive tract. And people want to know, well, what can I do to reestablish a healthy microbiome after the antibiotics have done something destructive? Also a great question. I actually got this very question two times in the last two days from different patients, actually. (laughs) You know, so the first thing that I say is that 
yes, we know that antibiotics can be a problem. It's it, they, it could be almost like a tsunami happening in this little ecosystem you have in your microbiome. But the important thing is to remember that antibiotics can also be life-saving medications. So if you have a major infection, you have a pneumonia, you have a cellulitis, you you know, you have a bacterial infection which could cause you a threat to your health, you need to take the antibiotics. That's why we live in a civilized society in 2020 right now because we have the tools to allow us to live longer by, you know, fighting infections that are causing us problems. It will cause a, an issue with your microbiome and we'll deal with it at that time and afterwards, you know, but that's no no reason to put your life at risk. So that's kind of like the footnote to this conversation. But if you know that you're going to need antibiotics, then there are, you know, uh, the obvious things that you want to do to help make your good microbiome, the lifestyle factors, maybe you want to double down on a lot of those things so that we make sure that we are doing the right thing, having the proper nutrition, eating enough vegetables and fruits and making sure we're taking care of our health and lifestyle factors. Uh, that's some of the things that we talked about. Then you can also take probiotics and prebiotics and, you know, make sure you're eating probiotic foods and prebiotic foods. And, you know, um, we can monitor the um, health of your microbiome through that and see if there's something particular that comes up um, that uh, we may need to uh, throw in there to the mix to kind of help keep the balance. And oftentimes it's not that big of a deal. Um you know, you take the antibiotic, you get over it, you support yourself through that process. And then afterwards, you can focus on rebuilding the microbiome. It can be done. It's not a, not a, oh my God, I have to take this antibiotic for a pneumonia um, because I'm sick and have a fever and now I'm not going to have a microbiome. I mean, I, I wouldn't think like that. When we talk about the bad parts of antibiotics, a lot of things we're talking about really are, um, yes, they can impact your microbiome when you take a course of an antibiotic, but the worst part of antibiotics is the unnecessary use of antibiotics because often sometimes you get a cough and the doctor would give you a Z-pack and it's a viral infection. You didn't need the antibiotic in the first place. And many people do this multiple times a year. And that is that really does a number on your microbiome for no reason. And also food quality because a lot of the food supply is doused with antibiotics and we're eating uh, meats, uh, the, you know, the, the animals are often pumped uh, full of antibiotics. It, it helps fatten them up and um, you're eating some of that as well. Um, so one of the studies I looked at uh, a while back when I was writing a book chapter suggested that the average American might ingest uh, 200 grams of antibiotics in their in their food supply on an annual basis. I mean, that's kind of crazy to think about that. It is. Uh, Dr. Singh, we often hear from people who have had to go to the dentist and mm -hmm. prophylactically mm -hmm. they are given a class of medications called fluoroquinolone, Cipro, Leviquin, and sometimes, not infrequently actually, they end up with a C. diff infection, yeah. which can be really devastating. Diarrhea that is nonstop, it can even be life-threatening in some circumstances. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, it's sometimes kind of challenging to be able to get the microbiome back in balance. So I'd like you to address that briefly. And then I'd like you to talk just a bit about PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. Okay. Your colleagues, gastroenterologists, love PPIs because they heal ulcers so quickly. They're so effective. Now, of course, people can buy them over the counter. You know, there's there's Nexium, there's Prilosec, there's Prevacid. Mm -hmm. And people may not read the label that says you can only take them for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And so I worry about the impact of PPIs on the microbiome and the possibility of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So mm -hmm. two things very quickly before we close out the interview. One, the problem of C. diff infections. And number two, how to deal with proton pump inhibitors that it seems like are just about everyone's favorite drugs these days for heartburn. Okay, awesome. Yeah, two very big topics. So I'll try to keep it as concise as possible. Um, actually, they kind of go hand in hand because PPIs can be a risk factor for C. diff as well. Um, but uh, yes, uh, it is not uncommon for someone to get a C. diff infection after taking antibiotics. Um, and one of the more common scenarios is actually after getting um, 
uh, some oral care done. Sometimes one of the antibiotics that they that's often used is clindamycin, and that's famous for um, uh, being a contributing factor to C. diff infection. And so C. diff is a bacteria. Uh, we should point out that C. diff can actually live in your microbiome. It may be in your microbiome right now. You don't even know it. it could, so it could be what we call a commensal, something that lives there um, and doesn't cause a problem. But when you take an antibiotic, for example, you may be killing all the police officers in there who are keeping the C. diff in jail. And when they're gone, um, then the C. diff says, ah, now's my time to play. I'm going to start making toxin because that's what I like to do. And as a result, you get diarrhea and you get a fever and it's a, it's a pretty rough infection. There is a treatment for C. diff. Uh, there's particular antibiotics that you can use. This is a situation where you should be using antibiotics because this uh, infection, if it goes untreated, can actually be potentially life-threatening if it gets really out of control. What we use these days sometimes when the C. diff is difficult to treat, because a lot of times you treat it once and it goes away, but uh, also it can recur or it may be difficult to make it go away. There are probably a number of different factors that contribute to that, but um, just trying to focus on the big picture. Um, one of the things that we use uh, is fecal transplant. So this is the one indication uh, that is uh, approved by the FDA in the United States uh, for fecal transplant. And well, how I look at fecal transplant is that it's basically a uh, the the mother of all uh, probiotic uh, enemas uh, that you could give yourself. You can give it in two different forms. The, one of the ways that I do it predominantly is through a colonoscopy. So you do a colonoscopy and you uh, get the donor stool and you dump the stool into the end of the colon. And it's like magic. I mean, I, every time I've done it, I've seen people the next day just have complete resolution of their symptoms. And it usually stays that way. Um, so it's the high 90s, you know, as for 90% uh, of people that respond very nicely to fecal transplant. So basically what you're doing is reconstituting the microbiome. The microbiome is in disarray. Um, the police officers uh, are gone, nowhere to be found. So here you go. We were dropping off a new shipment of police officers and uh, it gets the infection under control. PPIs are another big topic uh, in GI. And yes, just like we were talking about antibiotics being life-saving medications, PPIs can be a life-saving medication. And, you know, if you're in the hospital and you have a bleeding ulcer and you're, you're very sick, you're going to get a PPI, even for me, because we want to be able to control the situation fast so that the bleeding can stop and that you don't die. There's, a, there's morbidity and mortality associated with bleeding ulcers. But what we don't want to do is have you continue that PPI forever after you get out of the hospital. Um, and uh, we also want to try to avoid you taking the PPI for no reason at all, um, where, where you don't need it. Um, you know, the days of taking the PPI for what we call, we used to call GI prophylaxis. It used to be part of the standard order set. When you come into the hospital, no matter who you are, they give you uh, a PPI just to protect your stomach. I mean, if you don't need it, there's probably no no reason to take it because we don't want you to have exposure uh, to potential other problems. If you were in the hospital and you were that guy who were in the hospital, you know, we you take it for a set period of time and then you stop. Um, that's what these medications were designed to do from the beginning. They weren't designed to be chronic medications. But the point that you're probably making more so is that these are over the counter now. And so somebody gets stomach upset, they get a heartburn, they get indigestion, they may run and get one of these over the counter PPIs. And that's really what we'd want to try not to do. We want to try to use natural therapies as much as possible. And there are some treatments that work just as well or even better than these PPIs, number one. And they're better for your health and your microbiome, number two. And um, the other thing we want to do is look at why you're having these symptoms. Are you having indigestion and heartburn because you're eating in and out burger every day for dinner? Are you drinking alcohol late at night? Are you snacking and eating ice cream uh, as dessert in the nighttime? You know, or, uh, you know, what are your habits? What are you eating? Uh, how, how much do you weigh? Could you afford to lose a little bit of some weight? Are you under a lot of stress? Are you sleeping enough? All of these factors, believe it or not, are also risk factors for heartburn and reflux as well. So if you do uh, make some changes in some of these elements, you may find that the reflux gets better with no medication. And that's really the fascinating part about how the body works. Uh, some of the things I like to use 
in heartburn are DGL, which is deglycerisinated licorice. I often use ginger. Ginger is one of my favorite herbs. And slippery elm. Those are that's kind of one of my go-to cocktails um, when uh, when I'm treating heartburn. And a lot of times when people come to me on PPIs, we use these things to try to get them off of the PPIs. And yes, it can be done. I've done it many, many times. Dr. Singh, in wrapping up our interview today, perhaps you could just tell us your perspective on taking ownership of our health, what we can do, and in particular, how testing, as with the home health plan of Verizona, can make a difference so that you can work with your healthcare provider to get the absolute best care possible in this era of precision medicine. Yeah, I think, you know, this is really how we all need to start thinking. Uh, the The old days of going to your doctor and getting your physical done, uh, I, I think, are, are really gone. Uh, I, I don't really know what anybody really gets out of those annual physical exams. Really, our body changes on a regular basis, and we need to monitor those parameters on a regular basis. If we don't, then we're really not owning our health. And actually, I'm writing a book called Own Your Health <laughs> to that point. That's what the whole point of the book is, and is teaching people about how we need to look at parameters of your health and how we need to monitor them throughout the year so that we can make sure we stay on top of our health rather than being underneath disease. That's one of my favorite sayings that I came up with as well. And so really, this is not just preventive medicine. This is preventive medicine plus because preventive medicine in the past was, oh, just go get an EKG and your cholesterol check and we're we're preventing a problem. But I don't think you're really preventing anything if you're not looking at everything that you need to look at in order to make sure you're really looking at uh, what, what needs to be done to prevent a problem. So, you know, uh, we're on the forefront here. I'm um, Proud to be one of the uh, you know leading people and um, talking about precision medicine and uh, precision omics. It's definitely the way that the future of medicine is going to be practiced. Takes it, you know. You asked me earlier in the conversation. I don't think we really addressed it, but it takes time for all doctors to really come around to this type of thinking. I mean, it took over fifty years, in my understanding, for the stethoscope to be considered a part of um, a doctor's toolbox uh, to be used when examining a patient. Over 50 years. Now, if a doctor walks in the room without a stethoscope around their neck or in their pocket, you think, what is this guy? Is he even a doctor? I mean, he doesn't even have a stethoscope. So, I mean, this is how we're going to be looking at things uh, in the future as well. Like, oh, this guy doesn't want to check my genes or my microbiome or my hormone levels. I mean, what's up with this guy? You know, so... Um, the, those are the, the, what we're doing now as standard practice is really the old, is going to be considered the old way of practicing. We want to focus on the future because that's where we're all going. Dr. Marvin Singh, thank you so very much for talking with us on the People's Pharmacy Podcast today. My pleasure. Thank you for tuning in to this special podcast with Dr. Marvin Singh. You heard him mention the Verizona Health Club a few times. Verizona underwrites our podcasts and our radio show. Here at the People's Pharmacy, we believe in informed self-care. To do that well, you have to be able to monitor your health status. The Verizona Health Club makes that easy. It allows you to track your important health biomarkers, such as hormone levels, thyroid function, and inflammatory compounds. You can stay on top of your heart, liver, kidney, and metabolic health. You've heard a lot about the microbiome on the people's pharmacy. It plays a critical role in immune function and the brain, as well as gut health. But how do you measure the microbiome? It's all part of the Verizona Health Club plan. You can learn more at V-E-R-I-S-A-N-A dot com slash health dash club. As a special introductory offer for People's Pharmacy podcast subscribers, Verizona is offering a 50% discount for the first month of the Health Club. That's a $100 savings. To claim your discount, use the code PEOPLE50 when you check out. That's uppercase P-E-O-P-L-E-5-0, all one word all uppercase. Again, the URL is verizona.com, V-E-R-I-S-A-N-A.com, and the health club discount code is 
people five zero.